Good morning. Well, we finished our one word study this morning. And actually, that's a misnomer because it's not one word this morning, is it? Two words, Holy Spirit. You know, I want to start this morning by reading a passage of Scripture. It's found in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. Here's how it reads. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you who ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. But now, he says, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I really want to zero in for just a second on that phrase, it is to your advantage that I go away. How in the world could that be to their advantage? I mean, the apostles had Jesus with them. They could see him healing and exercising demons and calming the storm. They weren't much without him. They weren't at their best with him, but they were nothing without him. And now he comes back, he is with them, and everything seems to be fine and going in the right direction. And now he says, I'm going to leave you again. And not only am I going to leave you, that's the best thing. It's to your advantage. How in the world could that be to their advantage? How is that going to be a good thing for them? Well, because of this. Because when Jesus was in the body, he couldn't be everywhere all the time. He was confined by time and flesh and space. But the coming of the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would bring constant, uninterrupted fellowship. According to Jesus, here's what the Holy Spirit would do. The Holy Spirit would convict people of sin. And we see this happen in Acts chapter 2 in one place. When Peter is standing before that crowd of, of people who many had had a hand in uh, killing Jesus... And he speaks to them very pointedly, and it says that they were pierced to the heart. They ask, what must we do? And we know that 3,000 that day were baptized. How did that happen? Well, it happened by the Holy Spirit working through a mere man by the name of Peter. Secondly, Jesus said that the Helper would convince people of righteousness. What convicted people? What caused them to recognize a crucified criminal as the Son of God. What did it for the centurion? What led to the turnaround of so many individuals that we read about in Scripture? Well, quite simply, it was the work of the Holy Spirit, the helper convincing people of their need for seeking righteousness. And then third, notice that Jesus claims that the Holy Spirit would convince people of judgment. And that really just makes sense, doesn't it? that a person would be convicted of their sin, their need for righteousness, because there is a judgment coming. They all go together, right? All three of these are combined. What convicts the sinner concerning a future judgment and thus the need to repent? You guessed it, the Holy Spirit, right? Now, here's the question. Does the Holy Spirit still do this today? Maybe the better question is, does the Holy Spirit still work today? And the very fact that not everyone here is nodding their head yes shows that there's a definite problem in our understanding of the Holy Spirit, right? Let me tell you, folks, the Holy Spirit absolutely still works today. He is not an out-of-work author. The Holy Spirit absolutely is alive and well and working today. And I don't think many people in the religious world disagree with that. The question becomes, how does he work, right? That's where the debate comes in. Does he work only through the scriptures, through the word of God? Does he work through men like he did with Peter and the apostles, giving them supernatural ability so that they can heal the sick and raise the dead and all those things? Or is it a personal indwelling we receive at baptism? There's a lot of confusion on how the Holy Spirit works today. Mainly within the Lord's church, the debate is, does he work through the Word 
or is it an indwelling in the Christian? And my answer to that is yes. Absolutely yes, on both of those fronts. There can be no doubt that the Word of God speaks to the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells within baptized believers. Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and you can see the other passages listed there. However, the Word of God also indicates that the Holy Spirit is the instrument of instruction that we should have dwelling in our hearts. Ephesians 6, 17 speaks of the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God. Colossians 3.16, which we'll look at here in a moment, makes reference to letting the Word of God richly dwell within you. When you write the commands of the Lord on your heart, are you not allowing the Word of God to dwell within you? When you commit to doing God's will, you've got to know what God's will is, are you not writing those words on your heart and thus allowing the Word of God to richly dwell within you? And does that necessarily mean that the Holy Spirit doesn't work in other ways in your life? You see, I don't think this is an either-or proposition. I think it's and both. I don't think this is word-only versus personal indwelling. I think it's both. And I think the Bible is very clear on that. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 reads, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. We have done this passage a grave disservice because what we do is what I've cautioned you not to do so many times is we pluck out verse 19 and we make it stand by itself and we say this is why you don't use instruments in worship. Now, I believe there's good reason not to use the instrument in worship. But you do understand Paul is not making a defense for a cappella singing. That's not what he's doing here. He is not coming up and saying, okay, here's why you don't use the instrument, folks. That's not anywhere near the context of what's being talked about. In fact, in the original language, Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 is one long sentence. So to pluck out verse 19 and make it stand by itself It's just not good biblical hermeneutics. That's not good biblical interpretation. Again, don't get me wrong. I think there is good reason to look at a cappella singing and a defense for it. But plucking out one verse and making it stand by itself is never good. So what is is Paul saying here? What is he admonishing? Well, a couple of things here, right? Do not get drunk on wine. Okay, that's easy. I can do that. Just avoid wine. I got it. I I won't get drunk on wine. I'll avoid that. Okay. And then be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Okay. Well, how do I do that? The first one's pretty straightforward, right? The second one, not so much. I can avoid wine. I can avoid getting drunk on wine. But how do I I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, look at uh, verses 15 through 17 leading up. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You notice this, don't do this, but do this kind of argument that Paul is laying forth. Do not walk as unwise men, but as wise. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul is trying to open the eyes of the hearts of these Christians. And he is saying, this is how you are to live as a child of God. You are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You are to be led by the Spirit. You are to live at the center of God's will. The same Paul who said these words also says that when you are led by the Spirit or when you live a Spirit-filled life, it will produce certain characteristics, certain attributes. Remember that? Galatians 5, 22. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that are produced when one is being led by the Holy Spirit. And then notice Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Same kind of thing, isn't it? I mean, it's the same thing. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with wisdom and understanding. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. 
And what happens when the word of Christ dwells within you? Well, it changes everything, doesn't it? That's the context that we're looking at here. Paul's not simply giving a defense for a cappella singing. This is Paul saying you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it changes everything in your life. So the question becomes, what does being filled with the Holy Spirit look like? Well, he tells us. By speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart. Always giving praise to God. If you're filled with the Spirit, you constantly give thanks for all things. You're subject to one another out of reverence to Christ. Do you see both here? It's both the Word of Christ richly dwelling within you and the Holy Spirit indwelling the Christian. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within you, whether it be in word or the gift that you receive at baptism, you produce things in your life like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And when the word of Christ richly dwells within you, the result is understanding and wisdom and thankfulness. It's and both, not either or. Look, there, there have been many good brethren that have debated this topic. And they didn't hate each other's guts over it. This should never be cause for division. There's a lot of things about the Holy Spirit that are a mystery to us. We just don't understand and there have been many scholarly individuals within the church that have debated this topic, and they walked away as friends. I don't believe this is a salvation issue. If you want to believe that the Holy Spirit works only through the Word, I'll debate that with you, but at the end of the day, we're still friends, and we're not going to divide over that. But I do believe this. I do believe it is a gross misunderstanding to try and claim promises for ourselves that were not given to us. And that happens all too often when studying the Holy Spirit. There are some matters that are related to the Holy Spirit that require the serious Bible student to do some discernment so as not to misapply the Holy Spirit. For instance, Matthew 10, verses 19 and 20. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. This was not written to you. It was not written to me. You can't play, claim this promise. There are many people who have gotten distorted or off track when it comes to the Holy Spirit because they are taking passages that apply to the apostles and applying them to their lives. The Holy Spirit does not work through you like it did through Peter. And the major difference between the apostles and us is this. We have something they didn't have. We have the Bible. Why do you think they needed the Holy Spirit to guide them in all truth? Because they couldn't turn over to it, Colossians 3, 16 and 17 and say, let me give this to you. Here's what Paul said. But when the perfect comes, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, speaking in tongues, prophecy, these things will be done away with. Why? What's the perfect there? Some people say, well, it's Jesus, and Jesus hasn't come back, so therefore we still have all these spiritual gifts. No, the perfect there is neuter, meaning it's not male or female. It's not talking about a person. Perfect in 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about divine will, complete revelation. It's the Bible, and we have that now. So understand, you can't claim these same promises. That is a gross misunderstanding and misapplication of Scripture. Here's a very important truth that we need to remember when the Holy Spirit. Just because the Holy Spirit dwells in you doesn't mean that He operates the way He did in the first century. Much of the confusion concerning the Holy Spirit is the re direct result of of religious folks wanting to claim promises that were never intended for them. You know, there are certain topics that are just, they seem like they're off limits in the church. You notice that? I know that when I get asked to speak somewhere, like at Red River, where Mr. Robinette is on the board, I get to see him and his lovely wife every year, you know, Vernon, any time that Jerry asked me to speak at Red River and they give out topics, there's two topics I never want. 
don't give me marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and don't give me the Holy Spirit, right? You know, those it's always seem to incite a discussion or a debate, right? You never can win on those topics, it seems like. I'm kidding a little bit. There are certain topics that just seem off limits. We know this in regular life. You don't ask a woman her age. You don't ask her how much she weighs. You don't ask a man if he knows what he's doing. Just don't do that, right? And in the church, it seems like there are certain topics that are just off limits. And the Holy Spirit seems to be one of those. We don't want to talk about it. Maybe because there's some mystery around it, and, and maybe it's because we're afraid of saying something wrong. It's a pretty hot-button topic in the church and has been for a long time. Many people would feel that because I believe that it is a personal indwelling as well as the Word, that I'm a liberal, that I'm off base, that I have to be ostracized and disfellowship. There are people who believe that, and maybe that's why people don't want to talk about it. But what is happening is that we have turned the Holy Spirit over to the charismatics, and we've let them have it, because we don't want anything to do with it. And by our ignoring the topic, we have allowed the voice of confusion to be the only voice being heard. We should never be afraid or avoid a biblical topic. Ever. That's not who we are as a people. We are people of the Word. We should never be afraid to approach God's truth and God's Word. Ever. His Word doesn't need us to apologize for it. And so we approach this subject the same way. And here's what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit that no one can refute. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a He. It's not an It. The Holy Spirit is personal. When Jesus prepared for His return to heaven, He promised to leave the Comforter. Comforter here in the Greek is a combination of words. Comforter is derived from the Greek roots that signify beside and to cause. So therefore, comforter denotes one who has been called to the side of another for assistance. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a divine being. Just like God, just like Jesus. He is part of the Godhead or what we sometimes call the Trinity. The Spirit is mentioned in biblical context in which he ranks as a divine person right alongside the Father and the Son. At the close of the second Corinthian letter, Paul prays that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit might be with them. Paul had no problem putting the Holy Spirit right alongside other divine beings like God and Jesus. Something else, the Holy Spirit is a gift received at baptism. Some contend that the gift of the Holy Spirit that's mentioned in Acts 2.38 is simply salvation. But that seems redundant, doesn't it? It seems as though Peter is referring to something different, something that comes as the result of the forgiveness of one's sins. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If baptism is different from repentance, then isn't salvation different from the gift of the Holy Spirit? It would seem that way. Still others argue that the gift is supernatural abilities, which we don't have today. So that when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism in the first century on the day of Pentecost, what they received was supernatural ability, and that's out. We don't have that anymore, so therefore, that's over and done with. But there is no indication in Scripture that people were that, that all kinds of people, thousands of people were running around healing people and exercising demons and raising people from the dead. There's no indication of that. So, it is a gift received at baptism. It is a gift that operates in our lives along with the Word of God richly dwelling in us. The Holy Spirit also bears witness with our spirit. Some would suggest that only the Holy Spirit's influence through the Word is what dwells in us. But if you go back and you read Romans 8, you'll notice that this indwelling is the Spirit Himself who bears testimony with us. And so based on this, I don't believe that we can say with any real confidence that it's just the Word. But then you look at the other ways that the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit dwells in the temple that is our body. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a pledge. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us in prayer. And the Holy Spirit helps us to be strong and fruitful. Here's a simple way to remember it. The three S's. The Holy Spirit is there to seal us, to speak for us, and to strengthen us. Just in basic terms, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Does this 
provide a comprehensive list of everything that the Holy Spirit does? No. And if you want that list, you're going to have to go to somebody other than me. And my guess is they won't be able to provide you a comprehensive list either. Because there's just mystery still. No matter what we know, there are still question marks, right? We don't know everything there is to know about God. But we still believe. And we still seek to know what we can know about Him, right? And so while there always be questions about the Holy Spirit, we got to be careful not to put a question mark where there's already a period. And there are things we can know about the Holy Spirit, things that I just showed. Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit is part of who God is. And therefore, we need to get to know Him. Now, it's not that everything I just said is unimportant, but I really don't want to to end this as an academic lecture. Because I think we always need to look at application. I think too many times our theology can get in the way of our application. I think too, too many times we spend so much time dissecting something that we miss the forest for the trees. And you know, within the Lord's church, within Christendom really, there are all these words and phrases that we use that sound, they sound so academic. And we know what they mean a lot of times, but people on the outside looking in don't. Like the scheme of redemption, what does that, what does that mean? Scheme of redemption, well we know what it means, right? But that's a more academic way of just saying the plan of salvation, right? Or we talk about soteriology, or we talk about eschatology, and it sounds so pedagogical and so scholarly, but what does it mean? And, you know, we, we throw this phrase around, a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we throw that around like everybody knows what it means. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, I hope to recalibrate your thinking this morning. I'm not sure an indwelling or a dwelling of the Holy Spirit is how we need to look at this. Rather than looking at being having the Holy Spirit dwell within us. Let's look at being filled with the Holy Spirit. How's that? I'm going to ask my trusty assistant to come up here. Zane, would you help me? This isn't magic, so we're not going to saw you in half or anything. So what I have here is I have two jars. I have a jar filled with grape juice, and it is labeled God. Please don't walk out of here saying that Chris believes that God is nothing more than a jar of grape juice. This is for illustration purposes only, okay? So you have a jar of grape juice that's going to represent God. We have a jar that says your life. So this is you and I, and it is filled with water. Zane, what I need you to do is I need you to take the jar that's filled with grape juice, the jar that represents God, and pour it in and fill the jar that is marked your life and do so without spilling a single drop, okay? Can you do that for me? I don't think so. No. Okay, why not? Because they're, they're both full. He says they're both full. So, let me get this straight. What you're telling me is that you can't fill something that isn't empty. Is that what you're saying? Not without spilling anything. Not without spilling anything. Okay. So it's got to be empty if you're going to fill it. Absolutely. Makes sense. Okay. Everybody with us so far? So when we talk about being filled versus dwelling, here's what happens. We think we're baptized, or we are baptized, and we think we've got the Spirit, and we're all good, right? But what happens so often is we have a little bit of the Spirit already added to us, and that's not scriptural. I've got some Kool-Aid here. Cherry Kool-Aid. This Kool-Aid is going to represent the Holy Spirit. Again, do not leave here this morning saying Chris believes that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than powder. That's not what I'm saying. So if we add the Holy Spirit to your life, you were baptized, you received the Holy Spirit as a gift at baptism, now you are filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Now there's a problem here, though. Okay, this looks right to many Christians. For many people, this seems right. I've got... Me and the Holy Spirit now. But what's the problem? Good. You're a smart kid. Take after your mother. <laughs> Zane says there's still a whole lot of me. And that's the problem. 
when you go to a coffee shop, whether it be Starbucks or Mad Coffee or somewhere like that, and if you don't get like a Frappuccino, Cappuccino, Mocha, Macchiato, whatever that is, if you get just regular coffee, the barista is probably going to ask you a question. What is that question she always asks? Sam, you were there last night with me at Starbucks. What does the barista always say when you get a regular cup of coffee? Exactly. Do you want me to leave room for cream? And that's what we do so many times as Christians. We get baptized and we leave a little room for the Holy Spirit. When that's not what this is about. Here's what has to happen. Completely poured out. You are empty. So now God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Word, it can richly dwell within you. But you've got to empty yourself first. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. You did a whole lot. Thanks. You cannot be filled until you are emptied. Listen to me, folks. There, there are a lot of well-meaning, sincere Christian people who have been baptized. And at baptism, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit may be dwelling in them or may have dwelt in them at one time, but they are not filled Something has happened along the way and they are no longer filled with the Spirit in that they're not faithful. They're not loving. They're not kind. They're not compassionate. They're not self-controlled. Something happened along the way. So it's not just about baptism. It's not just about an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's not just about turning red. It's not just about leaving room for cream. It's so much more than that. It's about being filled. And you can't fill something unless you empty it first. And if you are not empty, if you haven't been empty, we want to help you with that. And I have no doubt the Holy Spirit wants to help you with that. But you cannot be filled until you do that. If you have been filled at one point and that you had the dwelling of the Holy Spirit at baptism, you received that as a gift, but, but you're not living a Spirit-filled life. And maybe you, maybe you need the prayers and support of this church family. We'd love to help you with that. This is a time of year where we make so many New Year's resolutions, right? We want to get more fit. We want to stop doing certain things and, and start doing new things. What better way to start the new year than to get right with God? Allow His Spirit to fill you. If we can help you this morning, come down as we stand and as we sing.